Third part. Silver. As a protection against evil. D said, evaluating the balance of one of the arrows as he looked up at the sky. Could it be? With those hoarse words, a human face began to rise from the palm of D's left hand. Astonishingly enough, it was grinning. Was it that girl, D? D clenched his fist. With a squeal, the human face faded. Its appearance had been fleeting. Shaking his head a bit, Mika asked, Did someone scream just now? He was staring at the hunter's left hand. You must have imagined it. Uh, okay. The stupefied boy still didn't quite comprehend either this situation or the one before it. Yet his ears caught a voice not entirely angry or cold, saying, What are you trying to weasel out of this? If we're talking silver arrows here, it can only be her. Glenna off. D gave his hand a violent shake. As if to deal the coup de grace, and then asked, Can you walk? Nodding, the boy stiffened. He just remembered the business with the demonic invertebrates. Wrapping his arms around himself, he was starting to collapse when D said to him, Uriah was taken. The hunter's words ran a stiff wire through the boy's sagging frame. Taken. Where is she? You were the last one to see her. Stunned, Miko shrank back. The little blue eyes in his tiny face blinked repeatedly, and then unexpectedly focused on a point in space. Oh, that's right. There was this woman named Lorelai, and she went that way. He pointed in the direction of the road that had brought Dee there. How long ago was this? After thinking for a moment, the boy replied, I don't really know. Ten minutes, maybe twenty. I'm going after them. You wait here. No, no way am I doing that. I'll bring her back. You'll just be in the way. The boy fell silent. I, I could help, somehow. No one's after you. Just stay here a while. Without waiting for Mika's reply, D leapt from the stone lip and sailed through the air. Will we make it in time? You don't have a horse. The horse voice said, becoming a wind that whispered in the hunter's ears. As he landed, D raised his left hand. Fortunately, we're downwind of them, yes, sir, the horse voice said with satisfaction. Those woods over there, but make it fast. I smell blood. We might be too late. Less than two minutes later, D charged into the forest more than a mile and a quarter from the quarry. Although it stood to reason that a damp here would inherit some of the like strength of the nobility, and this young man had a speed that would shock even pure-blooded nobles. Taking a measure of his surroundings, he dashed another two hundred yards, and then halted. There we go, the hoarse voice said. A clearing suddenly appeared between the clusters of trees. Just off to the right stood a black carriage with a team of four horses, and about ten feet from area crouched on the ground. Lavishly decorated with gold and drawn by gorgeous black steeds, the carriage was clearly that of a noble. Uriah had been brought to this clearing by Lorelai, and a noble had been waiting here. It was obvious what had occurred. Even the speed of these legs hadn't been enough to prevent this tragedy from unfolding. However, before Dee could even approach Iria, he noticed something. 
and there was no smell. Actually, there was the lingering scent one would expect to come from the gore clinging to the dagger, Rhea clutched in her hand. But no scent of blood drifted from her, and her throat was free of wounds. Looks like she's okay. Not only that, but she might have bagged a prize turkey, too. The whore's voice was referring to the jet black cape and other garments that lay between Maria and the carriage. Ash gray dust clung to them in spots. Dee lifted the cape. Dust billowed up, falling back to the earth or riding off on the almost imperceptible breeze. A knife for self-defense, and a bracelet with electronic weaponry, plus the cigar in that crest. No doubt about it. These are all that remain of Mitter House. The horse force trailed off in surprise. D looked at Uria. It's just... Well, I can't really see that girl dispatching a noble and not even getting bit. When you think about it, Mitterhouse was a ruthless, vile monster. One of the ten worst on the entire frontier. To take him down so easily... Mm. Is that someone else over there? Beyond the enormous tree that loomed beyond the carriage, a foot in silvery robes could be glimpsed. Going over to Chuck, Dee found the corpse of Lorelai who had been stabbed through the heart from behind with a dagger. He also discovered the driver of reduced to dust, still in his perch on the carriage. First, this Lorelai who brought Uriah here was stabbed from behind and killed. By the workmanship of the dagger, it seems Mitterhaus might have done the deed personally. Following that, Mitterhaus tried to attack Uriah, but was slain, and his driver was killed as well. After that skillful explanation, the horse voice fell into silence for a short time. Mitterhaus either attacked Uriah, or put her in his carriage, so he could take her away. Uriah must have been able to stab him because Lorelai had been put down first. Aria ran outside. Mitterhaus followed her out there. And that's where he croaked. Mitterhaus either attacked Aria or put her in his carriage so he could take her away. Aria must have been able to stab him because Lorelai had been put down first. Aria ran outside. Mitterhaus followed her out there. And that's where he croaked. His driver was trying to save him when he met his end. Got any problem with that? Nope. D responded. With the spell of Lorelai's song broken, Aria slew the noble. Simple enough. But easier said than done. Right you are. As good of a hunter as she might be. I could see her taking out some suitor nobility or hired warriors. But not slaying a greater noble with millennia under his belt this easily. As good as a hunter as she might be, I could see her taking it some pseudo nobility or hired warriors, but not slaying a greater noble with millennia under his belt this easily. Not even she got the drop on him. After all, once Lorelai's power over her was broken, Mitterhaus probably would have used his own hypnotism on her. Or did it not affect her? And though it seemed much longer, less than two minutes had passed since D had found Aria. Mitterhaus is destroyed. D told her, Did you slay him? Not moving her eyes from the spot on the ground where they were fixed, she replied, I don't know. K. 
can't recall anything. The last thing I remember. Here I was, Dee. When did you get here? It was you that took down Mitterhaus, wasn't it? Unfortunately, no. Dee's gaze once again focused on the pale nape of her neck. Not even his eyes could find the faintest flaw. He put his left hand against her forehead as well. But there was nothing out of the ordinary there. And that was the end of the matter. A tremendous mystery seemed to linger nearby, with its maw gaping disturbingly wide. But Dee got a rear up on her feet, and then helped her out on to one of the horses from the carriage. Dee, what on earth's going on with me? She asked in a tone so doleful, she seemed to doubt whether tomorrow would even come. Take the reins, Dee replied. His good looks and cold voice seemed enough to solve Aria's mystery. Nodding as if she understood as much, the royal woman gripped the reins, a smile rising on her lips. Chapter 3, End